If you want to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start there in just a second. 2 Corinthians 6. It's a little overwhelming to be back uh, preaching up here. It's a little bit overwhelming to be back here and not have Haley with me. Um, you guys know how great Haley is, and uh, she needs no praise, I suppose, but I, uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for the, for the family you've always been for her. So many of you raised her as your own daughter and granddaughter, and I can't express my love and my gratitude for the woman you all gave me um, for my wife, and for how you all treated me when I was here, um, and just the support and the friendships the relationships I made with a lot of you and with a lot of you kids, I still think about them and I miss you guys. I miss a lot of you very much. Um, I'm I'm passionate about being in Seattle. I'm passionate about working as hard as I can by the grace God has given me to help the gospel there, Uh, but I do miss the encouragement of singing with you all and the encouragement of hearing from all of you and learning from so many of you. So many of you were teachers to me and examples to me in faith, and you still are when I think back, but I miss getting to see it every week and get together with you and to be encouraged by you guys. I I can't express it enough. Um, I'm really, really, really grateful, and I'm grateful I get to be back here and encourage you hopefully today and this this weekend, and I hope that my lesson yesterday wasn't too much uh, for you. We were supposed to do a good cop, bad cop thing, and I kind of, I don't know what happened. I don't know if a demon inhabited me or something, but I kind of got, Bill did bad cop and I did like worse cop, I think. I kind of went, I went hard yesterday. And I hope that you, I hope that you guys especially understand where that was coming from, but I care about you. And I've seen a lot of kids get torn up um, and pulled away from faith by really, in the grand scheme of things, trivial and I'm going to say stupid things that ought not to have any pull. But for whatever reason, they become everything to us when we're young. And so that's why I got a little uh, over impassioned yesterday, possibly, I would suppose, I would say. But here to this morning, what I want to talk about is this idea of a life mastered by Christ. Bill's going to talk to us about the glory of God. And I want to talk about a life mastered by Christ and hopefully set us up for Bill, slam dunking this idea of us being God's glory in this earth. Um, Look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at this this first verse with me. I just want to look at this first verse to start with. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. And it's in the middle of this whole section where Paul is opening his heart and sharing his his ministry and his life and his all his heart with the Corinthian Christians. And he says in chapter 6, verse 1, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Let me ask you, if, if I asked this audience to raise your hands and I said, hey, how many of you are working together with God? And you might say, you know, there's ways we could justify, the ways we could say, well, hey, sometimes I work with God. Sometimes I'm working in the things that I know God wants me to work in. Sometimes I try to be the person God wants me to be. Sometimes I go to church. I don't want to sometimes, but I do. Sometimes I don't do the things I want to do. Sometimes I even have conversations with people about the things that I know matter. That's not the question. The question is, does your life, could you define your life as a co-worker with God? That your occupation, the, the very meaning of your life is that my life is given to work with God in his fields. That's everything to me. My job at work, that's secondary. My family even, which this is a hard thing to say, my family is secondary to my work with Christ. Now, of course, if you work with Christ, you work with your family. But they are still secondary to him. The fun I have, the the life I lead here on earth, it's secondary. Everything is below and beneath the work I do for Christ. That is foremost. That is primary. If I asked you that, and I said, do you work with God? Are you a worker with God? Would you feel like you could raise your hand and say, yeah, I am? I hope you would. But as I read that and as I think about Paul and as I read Paul and I think about this example of being a worker with God, I say, man, I think I have a long way to go. I have a lot of self to cleanse. I have a lot of complacency and a lot of laziness and a lot of selfish, arrogant pride that I need to get out of my system before I can really call myself a worker with God. I'm not trying to be overly self-deprecating. I'm just saying this is a high calling. And as Paul worked with these Christians, and I think part of what he's doing is he's opening his heart to be an example to them. He's showing them who he is so that they will see who they ought to be. And by extension, then who we ought to be, who you ought to be. That we ought to have a life that, that the foremost 
uh, the biggest, the best, the, the greatest desire and need of my life is to work for God, to work for his cares, to work for his desires, like we talked about yesterday, to love God with my whole heart, and then to look at the people in this pews next to you and love them as yourself, to encourage them every single day. Who in, hey, by the way, we talked about encouraging each other every day. Did any of you guys encourage each other yesterday? I know you guys did just by being together, but did you like make an effort to encourage each other? You start to see why Hebrews 3.12 is a tough verse. Encourage each other every single day. I know I'm repeating myself, but I wanted to get that in there. Look here in 2 Corinthians 6. So he says, hey, we're working together with God. We're co-workers with God. But then he says, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Have you ever thought about that statement? What does that mean? What does the grace of God do? What's the grace of God about? What would you say? I mean, you kids, what do you think the grace of God is for? What is it about? Any thoughts? Transformation, Transformation right? What else? There's another word you think of when you think of God's grace. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, salvation, right? How could you receive salvation in vain? If God by his grace, if Jesus Christ by his grace has saved you, how could you possibly receive that in vain? What does that mean? You know, this is a statement that on the, on the face of it seems like, all right, this is like a good Christian statement. But then if we don't think about it, we don't understand that there's something significant here. There's something going on with these Christians. There's an immaturity. There is a, a lack of spiritual focus, a lack of spiritual concern and prioritization that is going on that, that they could receive the grace of God, the transformation, the, the, uh, the salvation, all the, the benefit that comes from Jesus and his sacrifice, but receive it in somehow, in some way, and make it empty. How can we as Christians receive God's grace and make it empty? Do you have any ideas? Look what he says next. He, he quotes the Old Testament. He says, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says at the acceptable time, I listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, we look at this, and these verses are, are thought about, and we talk about them way saying, hey, look, today is the day to be saved. You know, that's, this would be the invitation. I'm in my sermon right now and say, hey, today is the day of salvation. Be saved. But who was he talking to? Was he talking to a group of unbelievers who needed to hear the gospel for the first time? Was he trying to get them in an altar call or an invitation up to the front to get baptized? Is that what Paul's writing this for in this letter? Who is this letter written to? Christians, right? So why is he talking about the day of salvation? Why is he quoting this? If you would, put a bookmark here. We'll be back in 2 Corinthians 6, but look at Isaiah 49, where he quotes from. Look at these verses in Isaiah chapter 49. I know, you know, the Old Testament, we get a little, sometimes the prophets, we get a little worried or worked up. But look, this verse is really straightforward. And this verse is about Jesus Christ himself and what his salvation is about. And I think it'll help us understand what Paul is trying to say to us and to these Christians that he was writing to. Isaiah 49 and verse 5. This is one of the servant songs. Isaiah 49, pick up in verse 5. Isaiah 49, 5. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise, princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a favorable time I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Does this sound familiar? This is where the quote. And I will keep you and give you a, for a covenant of the people to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate heritages saying to those who are bound, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Along the roads they will feed, and their pasture will be on the bare heights. They will not hunger or thirst, nor the scorching heat or sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them and will guide them to springs of water. Listen, I know that was a long reading from, from a prophecy, but I want you to see this. That, that Who does this sound like it's talking about? Do you see these first verses about this, his servant who was set apart from the womb, whose God is strength, his, whose God is his strength, who's gonna, what's he gonna do in verse six of Isaiah 49? 
He's going to bring the Jacob back to him. He's going to bring Israel back. He's going to, he's going to be a light in verse 6 to the nations. He's going to, look at the end of verse 6. What's going to be, happen because of this servant? At the end of Isaiah 49, 6, what's going to happen? A light to the Gentiles and salvation is going to reach what? The ends of the earth. Who does that sound like? This is Jesus, right? This is a prophecy. This is God's plans. This is what God had in his mind. When he, before the foundations of the earth, before the earth was even created, he had this plan that Jesus Christ would come and his salvation would reach everybody, us and everybody else in this world, the Jewish people and the Gentile people, everybody you could think of, that his salvation would reach everybody. And so the Lord says, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you for a covenant. To restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate heritages, saying to those who are bound, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They will not hunger and thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them. He will guide them to springs of water. You know, he's talking about the salvation that comes from Jesus, but part of what is going on in these verses is he's restoring them to the land. He's restoring them in, in, the, in, verse, in verse eight to this picture of inheriting these desolate heritages, to, to going back in these places that were broken and empty and, and just famine. And they, what's the idea of them going back and restoring it? What does that sound like? These desolate inheritances, these lands that they're going back to inherit once again that are empty and famine. When, why would, what would they have to do when they got back there? What would, they, what would be the idea? Is he saving them just to save them? Part of what's going on in these pictures, it looks like that God is saving them to, Jesus is sent to them to, to not only to save them, but to restore them to the glory, to restore them to the work, to restore them like Adam was supposed to tend and keep and work in the garden, that God restores us and saves us to, to be workers. You know, he was writing to a church in 2 Corinthians that was so caught up in themselves so caught up in their immaturity, so caught up in, in what he said or she said, so caught up in how people looked at them, how puffed up they were, how people thought of them. They were dividing over all sorts of things. And he even says in 1 Corinthians that he couldn't talk to them as adults, but he had to talk to them like babies because they were so immature. What he's saying here is, and I think the reason he's quoting from this passage, is saying, look, this salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, this scripture that you Corinthians and you Christians could go back and read is saying, look, Jesus Christ came to save you and he had a purpose for it. He had a, a goal. He didn't just want you to be saved. He wanted you to be saved and be a part of the work he has for you. And that's where Paul gets to back in 2 Corinthians 6. Look, look flip back to 2 Corinthians 6. From here on, Paul starts to go through and describe his ministry in these next few verses. In verses 3 through 10, he talks about what his ministry looks like. And it's a hard picture. It's a, it's a difficult picture of what it looked like for him to reach out to the lost, to evangelize to the world, to reach out and be a part of the work that Jesus was a part of. I don't want to focus on that. Because there's something else that he, he wanted for them first, to even get to that place where they could share the gospel, to get to the place where they could glorify God. Paul had something that they, for the Corinthians that they needed to work on. Look down in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. Look at verse 11, actually. Look at how Paul writes to them. He says, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. In verse 12, you are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Have you ever noticed this verse? Listen, do you want to work for God? Do you want to be in God's fields working and, and sharing the gospel and, and reaching out to people and sharing the transformational forgiveness of Jesus Christ, the grace he has for them? But do you ever find yourself limited or unmotivated or feeling like, I don't know where to start or what to do or how to get involved? And you know what often is the case? You know what stops you? It's not me. It is, and even, even if I'm not that great of a preacher, it wouldn't be me. You know what it is? More often than not, that stops you. It's your own affections. This is why we've been talking about social media this weekend, is because how much of your attention, how much of your interaction, how much of your life do you give to just being on social media, to presenting a life, to, to, to talking and, and just being involved in these things where it's all about how you can look better or, or, or feel better or seem more connected, even if you're not, but, but this affection you have for being connected to these things that really are empty. 
And it's not just that. I mean, you could say so many things, so many affections. Some of us don't want to give up our, our relaxation time. Some of us don't want to get out of the comfort of our house. Some of us are nervous to talk to people. There's so many things that you'd say are my affections. But what do you care about most? If you really want to identify it, just think, what do I spend the most time doing? That's why we looked at screen time yesterday, right? I mean, some of us don't want to admit how many hours we spend looking at our phone by ourselves You know why we aren't equipped to be servants of God? Is because we're restrained by our own affections, by the worldly cares and concerns. And it's just like the parable of the soil and the sowers. The the thorns come up and they choke out the seed that would grow and make fruit. But he gets a little more clear. Look at this. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. He says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony is Christ with Belial? Or what what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Listen, what 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 he gets to in this thing, look like you Corinthians, you Christians are so caught up in looking and being and feeling so connected to the world. Do you think that that's what social media is about? Listen, did, did God, I mean, you could say maybe by extension God invented it, but did God invent social media for Christians? Is it a necessary thing for you? Can you not survive without connecting on these social media apps? The point I'm making is <laughs> there is this idea in here where Christians, we connect ourselves, we, we bind ourselves to these things, we bind ourselves to other worldly people, to worldly inventions, to worldly you know, medias and worldly environments and these things that we think we have to be a part of. If I wasn't connected, I wouldn't know anybody. If I wasn't on social media, they wouldn't know how my life's going. They wouldn't be, I wouldn't have these opportunities. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be a part of these social circles. I wouldn't be seeing all these things that I'm seeing. Is that what your life is made up of? I want to go back to this verse, but one of the verses I really want to focus on is in Titus chapter 2. Turn to Titus 2. And right after this, we'll come back to 2 Corinthians 6, and then we'll be done. But look at Titus 2 and pick up and look at verse 11. Because the center of this, this idea is, is what the problem is, well, the reason we get caught up, I think the reason any of us, young and old, get caught up in these affections, these things that are empty, these things that won't equip us or enable us or help us to be the workers for Christ that Christ died for us to be, is because at the root of it is there is a misunderstanding of Christ's grace. There is maybe a one-sidedness to it, that we think Christ's grace is about forgiveness and about saving me, and that's it. But we have a, a small definition of salvation. We have a small definition of grace, because in Titus 2, Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, helps us appreciate another element of grace. It's transformational. It's about forgiveness. But look in chapter 2, Titus 2 and verse 11. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. This is, you know... We get this, but what does God's grace do in verse 12? Mine says, instructing us, instructing us. Listen, this is, this is part of the problem where we get these affections, we get these things, we get wrapped up in the world around us, or when we're young especially, in these, these, these media we're talking about, it's the same thing, different story, right? It's, Bill was talking about we had you know, instant messenger, we had, we had MySpace, we had th- the same things. Every generation has the same things, but right now these, you know, Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and all these things are these affections that distract us. And part of the problem is that we don't understand that God's grace is more than just saving me. God's grace is also about changing you. It's about transforming you. It's about instructing you. And if all your attention, if all your time is spent on your affections, or more bluntly, if all your time is spent on your phone, just scrolling through things, watching short videos, liking or posting, or just hoping that someone will notice a thing you posted, if that's all your time is spent doing, how much bandwidth do you have for God's instruction? Think about this. Titus 2 and verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly. Do you think that living sensibly would have a bedtime, possibly? To live sensibly, no no reason for saying that, by the way. To live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? Why? To redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people 
for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. I want you to notice a few things. This idea that God's grace is bigger than just saving you. I think sometimes us teachers, this generation, we've done a bad job of, of teaching kids that God's grace isn't just about being saved. That it's, we, we, we get to baptism, we say, hey, you need to be in the waters. You need to be connected to Christ, and you do. But then sometimes we aren't as connected to you after where we say, hey, you need to be changed. You have work to do. God has an idea. He has a plan. He has an ideal for your life where you would be involved and passionate and sharing. And this person who's just zealous. And sometimes we, are, we accept the lowest common denominator. You're baptized and you're here on Sunday morning. And it looks like from, the outs- from a, just a glance that you're probably doing all right. Is that good enough? Part of the reason that I think we're not interested, that we get, that we get distracted by all these lesser things is because we, don't, we aren't passionate about the, the huge, the, the beauty of the goal that Christ has for us. Listen, you're not the next generation. You are the church now. And if that's the case, then you have work to do, don't you? You have people to talk to. You have a, a life to live. You have things to get involved in. It's not just good enough to be here. It's not just good enough to be baptized. It's not just good enough to go to the, the church you think is the good church to go to. It is more than that. It instructs us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. It changes everything about your morality, everything about your decisions. Let me ask you, has your life been changed since you got baptized? Does it look any different? It, it didn't look much different for me for a long time. But look what he wants. What did Jesus give himself for? What was the reason? What was his grace about? What was the purpose that he had in his graciousness, in his selflessness, in the gifts he gave us through his death? What was the goal? Look at verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Think about that. What is a lawless deed? It could be breaking the law. I almost think of it as, as anything that's outside of God's word. And I know that sounds maybe overly simplistic, but think about this. God in his word has, and for throughout all time, in the Old Testament and New Testament, written out all these ways that we can be connected to him and connected to others, all these ways that we can be busy with the work he has for us. But what kind of work do we spend our time doing? Well, I spend my time doing whatever I want. I spend my time doing things where people will think about me and look at me and love me or at least say they love me or at least appear to love me. You know, Christ gave himself to redeem you. He bought you with a price. And this word every is important. He doesn't just want part of you. It wasn't just for one thing. It wasn't just the one sin he, he redeemed you from. But it was a complete purchase for all of you. How many lawless deeds do you bring into your relationship with Christ? How many, you know, not necessarily ungodly, but, but non-godly, I'll say, things do you bring into your faith that don't need to be there? What's the next thing? He, he gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed, and what next? To purify for himself a people for his own possession. Look, this is what we're talking about a lot, is that this life mastered by Christ would be a life where Christ could live with us, live in us, that he would be in our hearts by faith, that he would walk beside us and he would he would. Plot the path before us. This verse is exactly the title of this lesson. Do you, th- you ever think of yourself as someone possessed? Someone possessed by Christ. What, that, what does that mean? What are some of your possessions? It's, it's a hard, that's a hard comparison. This idea of possession, you know, we think of demon possession, we can kind of put pictures to that, right? Where there's a demon living inside you and you, you're not doing the things you want to do and the, the very things you do are the things you hate and it's like this whole scary kind of horror movie kind of picture. What would it mean for Christ to possess you? What do you think? What would it mean to be a possession of Jesus Christ, that you belong to him in such a way that every action, everything, every thought, everywhere you went, people said, that person, that's not been anymore. See, Christ died to, not just to save us, but to make us his people, to bring us close to him. And really what this lead is leading to is he died to make us a people zealous for good deeds. Listen, in some ways, I know social media is what's that's, what's a, uh, what we're talking about, but in some ways, it's just, uh, that's a symptom. That's, a, that's, that's not even the problem. 
that's not even some, in some ways worth talking about. It is because it's a problem, but there's something bigger. There's something deeper. There's something more at stake is that whatever it is, it might not be social media. There's enough other things. Sports can distract you. Actual face-to-face -face relationships can distract you. Money, your job, the things you start, your schoolwork can start to be a distraction. All these things can start to take precedence. We're talking about social media because it happens to be some of you are spending seven to nine plus hours on your phones doing this. So we're talking about it. But it's just one thing. Do you see the problem with this? What did Christ die for? He died to redeem a, a people that would be passionate, that would be zealous. There's this idea, he didn't just want us to do good things. He doesn't want us to be automatons, just doing this, input here, do the right thing, service here, help this old lady cross the street. He wanted us to be what? A people that are zealous, that our very hearts are given to just wanting to do good for everybody we meet. That's the example yesterday of that sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair and wept and washed him with her tears and the perfume who made a spectacle. Why? Did God command her to do those things? Was there a verse in the Old Testament that said, wash Jesus' feet with your hair? No. She did it because she loved. She loved much. Listen, there are so many lesser versions, and as, as we might have talked about this week, there's so many idols that we make of a life lived pleasing to God, that it's good enough for me to be baptized, it's good enough for me to be here on Sunday morning, it's good enough for me to just go through some of these motions that I see other people going through, but this is not why Christ died for us. He died to master our life and to be the one and only. And the problem that I see, the difficulty I see so often is that everything we're living for is just other people's approval, other people's eyes on us, other people's attention for just even a brief moment, or we're looking for me to be distracted for the moment, to just scroll and hope something funny, something meaningful, something insightful comes along, I don't know. Or worse, scrolling to look for something that, I, that tickles our, our brain and, and something that we can lust after, something that is tempting to us, just scrolling, hoping that something will come along for us. All these things come from this. And these things that aren't inherently evil become evil because they're everything to us. And we bind ourselves up and we hook ourselves into anything the world would feed us. Do you see the, the problem here? We're not letting God's grace instruct. We're not letting God's grace into our lives to lead us and to build us up, to help us be co-workers with him, to get us equipped to be in the fields, to serve God like we want to. But instead we bind ourselves with unbelievers and partner ourselves with unrighteousness and lawlessness and darkness and Christ has no harmony with that. Here's the thing. We, we think that the, we can take a little bit of the world and hold it close and it won't have any problems. It won't have any downsides. It doesn't matter that things that are done in secret have no meaning to the rest of my life. But you know, don't you? We all know. Go back to 2 Corinthians 6. I want you to see it as we finish up. I hope you'll think about that verse from Titus. How we think about the, the instruction from God's grace, the, the high standard, what, the purpose of Christ's death for each of us. But look here at 2 Corinthians 6 again, and we'll finish up after reading these verses. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. I know, already, I know we already read it. Let's read it again. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Listen, you know what's going on here? Let me ask you, are you finding godly things on your social media more often than not? Now, some of you said you use it to connect with other Christians and to try and keep these relationships going. I think there can be good to be very specific, I know I heard some of you talk about them. That's good. Like, use these in specific ways. Be very mindful if you do use it, to use it in a way that is mastered by Christ. But be honest with yourself. Be honest with me. How much of the stuff, the content that you're taking in is godly? How much? How much of it builds you up? How much of it has any harmony with Christ? I've been on social media platforms. You know why I got off of them? Because all I could find, as best I tried to avoid, all I could find was the world. That's all I found. And I lied to myself for a long time and just kept scrolling, kept looking, kept engaging, and it finally, 
through my stubbornness, God was patient and he showed me and, he t- and I saw that this wasn't, there was no harmony, there was no partnership that I could have with these things and still believe that I had harmony with Christ. That's why Bill and I call for you to, to think about it. I love that some of you deleted some of your social media apps. You know, you may redownload them. Listen, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life too much. But in this time where you don't have those social media apps, if you did download or delete some of those accounts, I want you to pay attention and ask yourself, do I need to go back? And if I do, how am I going to use it? But look at what's at stake here. You know, he calls us the temple of the living God in 2 Corinthians 6.16. Then what agreement does it have with idols? You know, throughout all of Israel's history, they tried really hard to live this life with idols in the very temple, and it never worked out. But look at the things that they missed out on because they tried to have all these idols in their lives, all these idols in the temple of God. Look, look what they missed out on. Look what they missed out on in Israel. This is God said in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, for some of us, that promise, those promises are just, you know, of course the words the Bible says, but do you ever think about this? Does God have to reach out and be your father? Does God have to make these promises where he says, I'm not just going to save you, but I want to have a personal relationship with you. I want to live with you. I want to live inside you. I want to dwell with you. I want to be your father. Some of us have good fathers, but some of us don't. And how much of a blessing is it that God looks at us and says, hey, I'll be the best dad you could ever have. Even if you have the best father in here, I think that God's a better dad, huh? Would you say? And God says, all I want is to dwell with you. All I want is to just be with you. I just want to be in your life. I want to be with you. Do you hear a parent in this? Do your parents ever say something like this to you? Like, hey, I just want to know how your day was. I just wanted you to talk to me for five minutes. Your parents ever talk like that? God's pleading and saying, look, look, all I want is for you to be my sons and my daughters. I want you to be close to me. And you can't be close to me and close to this world. You can't be close to me and have be connected and, and hooked in and bound in to just this total worldliness and ungodliness. There's no connection. There's no harmony. And so in 7.1, he says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Did you notice that yesterday? Those who fear the Lord... What we read in Psalm 115, those who fear the Lord, God will be a shield and a salvation to them. Listen, this sermon is probably at the, at the conclusion of it, one of the most basic lessons a preacher could preach. But I wanted to show you this because Paul was dealing with these immature Christians in Corinth some 2,000 odd years ago. And you know what they were doing? They were connecting themselves to the world spending their days thinking about the people in the world, looking for the approval of other people in the world, looking to see and lust after what they could in the world around them. They were doing the very same things you were doing. This has been a problem for people trying to serve Christ for, since the very beginning. And what did Paul have to say? Did he say, okay, you can do a little bit, but just make sure you manage it well. What did he say? Did he say, you can keep a little corner of that, but just make sure like 75% is for God. Is that what he said? What did he say? God jealously wants all of you. Jesus died to redeem a people for his possession. The grace of God came and instructed us and taught us to live differently, to be different, to have a life that will cut out for Christ, that Christ may speak and live through us. And some of you have received that grace. And some of you who have received that grace have received it in vain. And I want you to think about that. Because God's grace was given to you, not just as a gift to save you, not just so you get a free ticket to heaven, but God saved you because he wanted you. He wanted to live with you. He wanted to be your father. And he wanted to be your co-worker. He wanted to be involved in your life and help you share the goodness that he would give, to help you look at your friends and say, they need God just like I do, to be glorified. See, this life mastered by Christ, what it ends up doing, what it ends up being is a life totally given to the service and the work that Christ has planned. And that's so much better than just being saved, isn't it? 
Because God has some things in store for you that you, he would do with you. He would help you. He would build you up. He would work alongside you. He would change the very world around you if you're not caught up in your own affections. Listen, if you're on your phone scrolling for hours a day, what room does God have? What room does he have for you? What room do you have for him? Make room for him in your hearts, please. Let's pray. God, our Father, you have made magnificent promises to us and we look to you and we trust in you. We pray, Father, that you would dwell with us like you've promised. We pray that you would be our God, that you would be our Father, and that we would be your children, that we would be your people, Lord. Father, we earnestly desire that. We want that more than anything, but sometimes we get caught up in our own affections and our own distractions. Forgive us, Lord. I pray for these kids these young people, I pray for these Christians, I pray for these servants of yours, I pray that they would see you, make room for you in their hearts, and that all of us would make room for you in our hearts, and that our lives would be given to your service, and that our lives would be mastered by our King, Jesus Christ. We need you desperately, Lord. Please help us with this, and please, we pray, be patient with us as well. I pray we take these things seriously, Lord, and we pray, I pray you soften our hearts. All this we pray through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.